Right. Technically, the Super Bowl had actual football, but between Usher's halftime show, the Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey fairy tale, and that Beyonce album announcement, I barely remember there was football there. Today on the podcast, the Super Bowl gave us so much to talk about. Let's go. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Listen, last night, Kansas City won their second Super Bowl in a row, and that's very important information. I get it. But we are not here to talk about that because for us, there's only one place to start, and that is here. The one and only Usher Raymond IV performing his hit single, Yeah, headlining last night's Super Bowl halftime show. Look, we know this, right? We know the Super Bowl has a history of pulling in audiences for different reasons. There are people, I'm told, who are there for the football. I have never met them. I don't know who those people are. There are people who show up for the commercials. And last night, one of those commercials, at the end of it, Beyonce just casually announced a brand new album in a commercial. But also, a huge draw is the halftime show, and some of the biggest names in pop have performed. Prince, Beyonce, U2, Dr. Dre, and Rihanna. There's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot to talk about when it comes to Usher's show. And we got two people who are here to do it. David Dennis Jr., Kathleen Newman-Bermang. What's up, everybody? How's it going? How's it feeling? Hey, hey, hey. Hi, Alameen. Thanks for having Hello. us. Hello. I am delighted that you guys are here. Kathleen, I'm especially delighted that you're here because it's so <laughs> early where you are because you are in it Vegas. Is. You were in I Allegiant am. Stadium last night at the Super Bowl. Hey, I was. would you do me the honor of describing the energy in the building? Ooh, I mean, as the Kelsey brothers would say, it was electric. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you listen to the podcast. They say it a lot. I do now. Um, yeah, it was it was wild in the stadium. This was my first Super Bowl. Um, I grew up watching American football, so to be there was just like different. It was yeah. it was wild, you know. I'm not gonna lie, I got a little emotional being there in Vegas watching the game. And I was also cheering for KC. I was surrounded by 49ers fans, so I was like right in it. Just try not to get in fights. The, the energy, <laughs> it's, honestly, it's, it's hard to describe, but it was, um, I think you could see it maybe while you were watching and being there. It was so loud. It was amazing. I kept watching, waiting for you to pop up on the television and it didn't happen. And I'm, <laughs> I'm genuinely really, really upset about that. David, Den David Dennis Jr. and I were both watching on TV last night. David, what was, what was last night like from your vantage point, watching this great spectacle of American television? It was, it was a Super Bowl. And it was like one of the Super Bowls that you're like, re that felt like a everybody at the Super Bowl party. I wasn't at a Super Bowl party. I like am a diligent sports journalist who takes notes on the game and all that stuff. But, <laughs> you know, it was one of those things that you feel like everybody has something to be invested in at the game. There's some games where you go to and it's like just a football game and people are like, I'm just here for a commercial and there's like no interest. But there was so much going on from a pop culture perspective and a sports perspective and like this Americana perspective that it was like one of the more engaging Super Bowls from top to bottom that everybody had something to talk about. And it wasn't one that feels like somebody be sitting sort of in the corner, just like eating the Rotel and just bored. Like this was <laughs> engaging from top to bottom. I, I have to say from top to bottom, that includes the very first person you see when the Super Bowl broadcast starts, which is Post Malone, you know, um, yeah. in his sort of like little sort of folksy American era doing America the Beautiful. Then we go to Reba McIntyre herself doing the national anthem. It really felt like you're totally right, David Dennis. You're like this, this concept of Americana being woven throughout the entire night. I'm gonna, we're going to come back to that because of this whole Beyonce conversation. But we're not going oh, to be lost in all that. Not yeah. to be lost in all that was yeah. that my son was watching the SpongeBob feed on Nickelodeon, <laughs> which was an incredible bit of television that I think everybody should go back and watch if you watch the a regular grown up feed. So that's something to to tap into also. Yeah, for people I who also, don't, for, I just we should I, say for people who don't know, people you know like children are, can watch the Nickelodeon feed of the Super Bowl, which has SpongeBob doing color commentary. And SpongeBob yeah. has better commentary than the normal 
commentary. And every time that I see one of those clips, it's going viral. And I'm like, why didn't I watch Nickelodeon doing this? Kathleen, what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to mention Andrew Day, who sang Lift, Lift Every Voice, and she was incredible. Yes. And also just shout out. If we're shouting out the, the beginning, let's shout out Andrew Day as well. 100%. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Usher. We're going to talk about Usher's performance. But before we get to the performance, can you just give us a sense, Kathleen, of why this right now is the right moment for Usher to headline the Super Bowl halftime show? I mean, he's had a massive year. He had a massive year last year. Not only, you know, did he release new music, had some big collabs like with her and Money Long. He also created multiple viral moments, which I think is hard to do, you know, 20, 30 years into your career. Yeah. You know, during his very successful Vegas residency, he was bringing famous women up and serenading them. And that was just brilliant. But every time he did that, he would go viral. You know, Kiki Palmer, Jessica Alba, just to, you know, name a few of those. Yeah. Um, and then he does the NPR. Our Tiny Desk series. Yes. And, you know, that intro interlude to Confessions Part 2 goes viral. And so all of these moments added up to Usher having just one of the biggest years of his career. And I think for those of us who remember Usher's like orig original run at the top of the charts, he also evokes nostalgia that's yeah. like so strong that we're obsessed with him for life. So I think that the the combination in the Super Bowl halftime show has been tapping into that nostalgia for the past few years. So I think the combination of him having a big year and also um, just being a nostalgic choice made him perfect. I like that you say nostalgic choice, Kathleen, because the reality of it is that you and I, pal, we are aging into the demographic that they make the halftime show for. I and mean, they didn't rude. used to. <laughs> <laughs> that was but, very listen, rude. Well, as say. you enter the 35 to 49, as, they, as you enter this key <laughs> demographic and they go like, this is who they make content for, they start yes. to go into your past. I think this, we're just starting to enter this age of millennial nostalgia of us being this key demographic that, you know, they make a lot of television for but buddy we are just getting started rihanna last year usher this year i don't know who's going to be next year but there's something about the fact that you and i we are the key demo of the super bowl halftime show for the next like 15 years enjoy this while it lasts uh david were you going to say something are you looking you're about to say something uh, if we don't know who's going to be next year it's going to be taylor swift and like a <laughs> smattering of new orleans people like let's stop playing <laughs> I actually don't think that's true, but we can come back to that later. But I, can I just ask you, David, uh, for his entire career, Usher has been spending a lot of time celebrating his hometown, Atlanta. You live a few minutes away from Atlanta. What do you think of this Usher's, you know, I mean, his halftime show as a moment for the city and the way that it's recognized in the city? Yeah, this is a, a period of Atlanta folks being truly insufferable, starting last week uh, with Killer Mike uh, sweeping the rap uh, categories uh, for the Grammys and yeah. the celebration that's been then have been happening. But this was a very Atlantan uh, Super Bowl performance. And I would also say a very like catered directly to Black America performance that he yeah. did. There was no sort of like we're going to try to cross the railroad and try to make sure that there is something that makes other folks feel comfortable. This was very Atlanta, very the culture that Ludacris. I grew up in. Lil the John. South. There yeah. There's Lil John who looks like amazing. We could take some time. Like Lil John's been the gym. He looks like really good. <laughs> yes. There's like, you know, Jermaine you know, Dupree, did, you know, Jermaine yeah. Dupree is there, yes. you know, but he starts off. There was this conversation about what's he going to start off with. He mm -hmm. starts off with the Atlanta. He starts off with caught up and you don't yeah. have to call like these are the like there's OMG gets like a couple minutes with the skates and all that stuff. But he is like, I'm doing a very Atlanta thing with stripper poles and the skating ring <laughs> culture yes. and all of this stuff that is a carryover from the Vegas residency yes. residency, but also some that said, I am going to be 100 percent usher and the usher that my fans know for the entirety of this performance which is something that we do not often see yeah. when a lot of these artists sort of do these do these super bowl performances kathleen i have to say um usher asked for an extra two minutes usually the halftime show is 13 minutes he was like i need longer than this i need 15 minutes you were there you watched that performance you were maybe the only person who was like i'm here for usher maybe the football is secondary <laughs> here what, what yeah. did you make of the performance what was it like in the in the stadium oh it was Incredible. I mean, I think he made use of those 15 minutes. Absolutely. You know, as David said, starting with caught up, that felt like, you know, everybody knows caught up. So he's still catering to the Super Bowl audience as much as, you know, it felt like it was for us. And I know that there are some people that don't get it, but yeah. like black folks. We got it. Yeah. Um, and but I think he did a really good job of bridging that gap. So starting with caught up 
was incredible. I was dancing in the aisles. The Super Bowl, <laughs> as, as electric as I said that the energy is, yeah. it is a very corporate event. And so there were the people who were just like not dancing, who were standing there watching. Um, and there's so much going on, you know, in the middle of the field. I think, you know, at home, you're seeing the different camera angles. You're seeing them cut to things. I am I was just watching all of it and trying to take it all in. And it was really incredible to see. And also it felt like Usher at the very like top of his game. I don't know how he got those skates on and off. I don't know how he did <laughs> costume changes. The mic was on like the breath work. I don't know if he's getting enough credit right now for yeah. the breath work because I've only seen that out of Beyonce. Truly, Usher and Beyonce, it's interesting that we're talking about them both today because they are peers and they don't have any others. Uh, it's wild to me that you just said Usher and Beyonce are peers. Uh, I'm going to take a moment to digest that and to sit with it. But I yeah. agree with, I agree, in terms of the grandness of that show, David Dennis Jr., there was something about the ambition that Usher had for that show that kind of shone as he sort of moved from stage to stage to stage. Um, can we just talk about Alicia Keys for a moment? You know, the fact that Alicia Keys got that <laughs> David, what was that face? You made a face the minute that I mentioned Alicia Keys. What was, what was going on there? I mean, the mic was on for Alicia Keys also, and then, then, <laughs> and there was she a, missed the know, note. She missed the note. Out the gate. There was a little stumble. She missed the, the first gate. note of her performance. Yes, she missed the first note by a wide margin of missing the note, as about as, as about as wide as you can miss a note. But the recovery was great. <laughs> yes. The outfit, the outfit was like it makes you forget the the note was missed. Yes. It was like they had the good chemistry. She pulled it together. I'm happy. I'm happy that she was able to pull that because because as as much as the internet is like piling on to her and all that stuff she probably yeah. feels worse about it that that happened to her but they were able to sort of like come together and and make it uh make sense so i'm, I'm happy for that um and, and as, as terms of the usher performance the amount of sweat like we need to talk about the amount of sweat that this man which is it be like people do not sweat like that anymore when they're performing <laughs> they really don't and it they is really like don't. it was a james mm -hmm. brownsian level of sweat mm -hmm. that you have to like admire because he was in there putting in work I was worried Bring about back him. Sweat and romance in R and B. That's all I asked. Bring back. That's all drops. Kathleen wants. Sweat, sweat, romance, and rain. Like yes. let raindrops. We need more of that. And a happy Valentine's Day to all of you. If folks are just joining us, my name is Elamin Abdul Mahmoud, and this show is called Commotion. We're talking about the Super Bowl and the halftime show with Kathleen Newman Bermang and David Dennis Jr. Look, Kathleen, it was Usher's time to shine, but also this was a weird season for football because Swifty showed up, right? Like Taylor Swift uh, started dating the, the 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 player from from Kansas City, Travis Kelsey. Suddenly, we are talking constantly about Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift. I think there was an estimate about the the marketing value that Taylor Swift added um, to the NFL over the last few months as this relationship has been happening, and it's like something like three hundred and thirty one million dollars. There was a lot of conversation about her very presence overshadowing Usher's headlining moment. Was that actually the case? Would you say, Kathleen? Well, I didn't love this con this conversation to begin with because sure. I felt like it was taking away from his moment to even mention her alongside him like that. It just felt unnecessary. Yeah. Um, but as you know, I didn't watch the actual broadcast because uh, you were there. A flex. Because I was there. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't mentioned that yet. <laughs> um, so, you know, I missed some of these these big moments that people are talking about today, like Travis Kelsey, that Andy Reid moment. You know, Travis Kelsey blew up at his coach. I did not see that. I have no idea how many times they cut to Taylor. I don't even know where she was in the stadium. They yeah. showed her in the jump rope Tron like a couple times. Um, so she didn't impact my viewing experience at all. Sure. And as for overshadowing Usher, I don't think so. You know, um, from what I understand, they didn't show her during – his performance. Mm -hmm. Um, there were rumors that she was going to join him during his set, which that's, were wild. No, I'm so glad that didn't happen. Me too. Um, but I do think it's hard as a halftime performer to break out as the story of the Super Bowl unless you, you know, announce a pregnancy like Rihanna did last year, <laughs> or there's a controversy like the Janet Jackson, Justin Timberlake year, justice for Janet, always. Yeah. Um, 
you know, so if you just show up and do an amazing job like Usher did, I don't think there's much else to say other than that he he killed it. So I don't think he was mm. overshadowed, but I also don't think, you know, he's going to be the biggest story coming out of that event. It's Taylor and Travis. It's going to be that Travis outburst. It's Beyonce. It's Beyonce. Those are honestly, definitely yeah. the bigger stories for sure. I mean, David, we're talking about the Taylor Swift effect on the NFL's popularity, but this is an interesting moment because this is also happening as Jay-Z is now in charge of live music entertainment for the NFL. And we should say he took on that position after the NFL was criticized a lot about its stances on racism, particularly within the organization. Do you feel in 2024, does this feel like the year where the NFL is finally turning a corner and maybe fixing its image in the mainstream? No, uh, okay. the NFL has not, and the NFL does not care to. The okay. NFL, like like Colin Kaepernick, will will never play football again, and and that's something that will always hang over the NFL uh, when it comes to um, how they deal with with race and racism in this country in their own um, you know situation. Now they have had a good. Uh, year in terms of hiring black coaches, which has been a huge, huge issue with the NFL. But we got to see how those coaches get treated yeah. and what kind of um, longevity those careers have. But beyond that, we have to talk about how the NFL treats concussions, and we still have issues with them and and their their turf and how their um, players are reacting to that, and if they hit their heads and things like that. There are so many things that the NFL is involved in that feels, you know, that still feels like they have a lot of work to do. I mean, even before the the game. They held a press conference where they was invite only, which was to also keep a black reporter out of there who had, mm. you know, who was, had a lawsuit against the NFL for discrimination. So there's so much stuff that the NFL does that is, you know, that feels wrong, that a lot of people have issue with. And these halftime celebrations are sort of good PR and they're things that we can celebrate. But I think that we as, you know, a community have an, uh, have an ability to celebrate Usher and say that this is a great thing and say, yes, we have this black quarterback who is dominating the league. But when that dust settles, we can also come back and talk about the things that the NFL needs to do to be better. I think uh, I, I, we're going to leave it there when it comes to the NFL because it is time for us to talk about a massive, significant pop culture event. And we are going to start with this. This ain't Texas. Ain't no holding. Hey, lay our cards down, 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 down. So pop your letters. Blow your keys up. Sort of Come on. Kathleen, I have expected you to pull out a cowboy hat just in the transition. Cool. If I had from- one, I would. <laughs> from one segment to another. That is one of two new songs that Beyonce dropped last night. That one is called Texas Hold'em. The other one is called 16 Carriages. She also announced that she's going to have a new album coming out. It is called Act Two, aka Renaissance Act Two. It is going to be coming out March 29th. Everything that we know so far, Kathleen, about this record, about where Beyonce is headed, tells us that this is going to be a country album. Are we ready to explore this part of Beyonce's lineage, this this part of Beyonce's history as a Texan, as a country music fan who has kind of been very public about that? But now the moment has arrived. I mean, I'm ready <laughs> as a uh, daddy lesson Stan who loved it on first listen. Daddy lesson from ready. Lemonade. Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think the world is ready as uh, specifically the country music world. Hmm. You know, there were already headlines referring to the album as country influenced or inspired. No, this is a country music album, clearly based on these first two singles that we've heard. Yeah. Um, and they need to refer it. They need to refer to it as such. You know, with Renaissance Act One, Beyonce was clearly paying homage to the Black roots of house music. And it looks like here she's going to be doing the same with country music. And Elamine, you know, you've written extensively about how exclusionary the country music industry can be to Black artists, Mm -hmm. despite Black folks being at the root of its inception, like so many other genres. So I don't have faith that they're not going to try to exclude uh, Beyonce even though this sounds like it's going to be a pure country album, mm-hmm. we re- all remember that people were mad when she performed with the chicks. So <laughs> a whole album, I just, I think country music radio is going to, their heads are going to explode. The CMAs, their heads are going to explode and I'm going to love watching it. Um, <laughs> I just think she's going to put out a record as Beyonce does. That is undeniable. Yeah. So the people who do deny her will look dumb. 
I have to say that like there is a lot of history at play here, David Dennis Jr. There's a lot of history that maybe people are, are not always familiar with, which is the history of the way that genres were constructed because country music was designed as a the, – the, the reason we come to believe that you know country music is associated more with white people is because of like very intentional racist construction of the boundaries of genre. And the people who have never believed that for one minute are black people in the South because country music is Southern music. Country music has always been made by black and white people in the South. Um, and then you get to this moment, you hear that banjo. And in that banjo, and it's really important to note um, that when that banjo hits on Texas Hold'em, it is being played by Rhiannon Giddens, who's a really significant artist um, in black roots and country music. So can you just talk a little bit, David, about uh, country music and the South and black people and what it means for Beyonce to be reclaiming this history with this album? Yeah. So as somebody who grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, who went to black rodeos and like yes. did performances in these rodeo houses <laughs> yes. and like knows about this stuff that she is doing, like this is vastly important is what this reclamation is huge that what she is doing. And, and as you said, this is all the fact that we don't associate country music with black folks in general is, is largely due to racism, exclusionary, colonialism, yeah. gentrification, all this stuff. And to sort of remind folks of where the where this comes from is a huge huge undertaking that she's doing because obviously Beyonce is from Houston Texas like yeah. this is you know that is a huge part of that it's a huge part of why I, I you know last night I was you know trying to look for my big old Mississippi belt buckle that I had when I was <laughs> in, in high school I am ready I am ready for all of this like this is going to be a and these songs like let's not get it twisted these are great great songs yes. like these these were way you know i expected good you know obviously good music would be, but these are great 16 carriages is already a classic you know yes. what i'm saying like yeah. we we're looking at some great music from beyonce so i'm i'm excited to see what she does and what she does without even thinking about how white folks are going to respond to it cuz i yeah. part of me feels like that's not even a huge aspect of what she's doing is just going to happen anyway. Yeah, she's not. She she seems like she's entirely not interested. And, and I guess with this album, Kathleen, or so far what we know about this album, we get a bit of a clearer idea of like what Beyonce is trying to do here, right? Which is to mm -hmm. the the I'm rooting for everybody black of mm -hmm. of of music, right? Which is to say this is these this project Renaissance is about taking back genres that we invented, whether it's genres like house music um, that you know was founded by black people. To also, you know, the black origins of country music, and so I am. I'm going to be there the day that it comes out, March 29th, because this is for me personally a really significant moment. Kathleen, um, can I expect to see you in a cowboy hat when this album comes out? Is that where we're going next? Oh, absolutely! I'm ready to make this album my entire personality. <laughs> truly, <laughs> I'm ready. Yeah, I mean, Beyonce is one thing she is going to do is deliver um, a work that is stands the test of time and is one of the the greatest things we've ever heard she does that consistently yes. and so you know that's why we get so mad when she isn't recognized for that yes but uh something david just said just really hit me is that she doesn't do this for that right she does this for her own culture she does it for a reclamation she does it for black folks and so we're just going to enjoy it. We're going to dance to it. We're going to understand that this is ours. And who cares about anything else? I don't want to keep people from dancing to it. So I'm going to let you both go. David Dennis Jr., <laughs> Kathleen newman Romang. thank you for being here. You guys are the best. Thank you. All right. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Elmine. Of course. Kathleen newman Romang is deputy director at Refinery29 Unbothered. David Dennis Jr. is a veteran music journalist and culture critic. This ain't Texas. Oh. Ain't no hold em. Hey. So lay our cards down. Lexus Ooh. and throw your keys up. New music from Beyonce, that is Texas Hold'em. That album, by the way, Act Two, comes up March 29th. That's it for the podcast today. Beyonce's talking. I'm gonna stop talking. I'll let her do it. Do the rest of this. Tornadoes. Tornadoes.